Hola, hola. My name is Ramon, cosmetic formulator and sunscreen fanatic. And today we're going to be talking about all the tea around all the sunscreen drama that's been going down. If you are not aware or if you've just not savvy as to what's been happening, there's just been a lot of skepticism, a lot of mistrust around sunscreen, the SPF advertised and what brands are giving to us. I think due in large part to a misunderstanding of what goes on behind the scenes with sunscreen testing, what an SPF value actually means, as well as the limitation of what sunscreen testing and SPF advertising can actually do for us. And as someone who's actively worked in product development, is currently studying cosmetic formulation and again, sunscreen fanatic, I'm gonna give my perspective and the background about what happens behind the scenes with sunscreen testing, what it all really means and what it comes down to, as well as my own opinion, I'm gonna stress that part, as to what's been going down with all these different sunscreen brands and specific sunscreens that have failed to meet the mark of sunscreen protection factors. But before we get into it, I'm gonna ask that you hit the subscribe button, notification bell, so that you know when I post more skincare sunscreen and fancy related content on my channel give the video a thumbs up and down below in the comments let me know what is your perspective your opinion on all the stuff that's been going on with sunscreen has one of your tried and true favorites unfortunately been involved in any of these scandals sound off. So getting down to the nitty gritty of uh, first and foremost, what goes on with sunscreen testing, what process is put forth in order to get the advertised sunscreen on a bottle and what that really means. I mentioned this before in a few sunscreen videos, especially the ones talking about the whole Pareto scandal in the first place, which I'll have linked up here in the card. But specifically what goes down is you have in vivo testing done on human skin with sunscreen. You take someone's back, a smooth, even surface. So you have a lot of surface area. You test a control area, and then you test area with the sunscreen applied at the specific amount, which is two milligrams per centimeter squared and what you're testing with the direct uv exposure is how long and to what extent you get erythema which is redness from uv exposure which basically is like sunburn and you repeat that test a few different times on a few different people get a mean average of what the sunscreen protection factor is how long it took for erythema to occur and that's how you get the spf value on a sunscreen in my opinion that's where the first part of the inconsistency in sunscreen testing comes obviously you're testing on human skin a testing on anything living on any biological surface to me starts to bring up a lot of inconsistencies just because people's skin is different going back to the Pareto instance with that one there was at least i think three or four tests done each of which garnered different SPF amounts. The first two done by Inky Decoder, you got an SPF 15 and an SPF 19. Another one done by a German third-party lab got an SPF 28 or 30. And with each of those, there was still a range. It's never a specific amount on the dot. Again, what you're doing is taking a few different tests finding the average of that, and you still have to account what the range is above and below that. So you'll get like an SPF 30 plus or minus anywhere from like three to five SPF because that's how much of a window you have around that value. So that in itself with the inconsistency of what testing on human skin in vivo presents to you is an issue just because you have already a good window of protection with sunscreen. For example, you want to get at least a 30, but most times a little bit higher than that to be able to say your sunscreen is even an SPF 30. And ideally you do want to aim higher just because if something happens where your sunscreen comes into question in terms of protection value and they go and test it, you at least want to know that, okay, my sunscreen for sure got at least a 33 or 34. So me advertising it as a 30 is going to be a pretty safe bet. But on top of that, you have to consider who these sunscreens are getting tested on. I don't know if you're familiar, but there's something called the Fitzpatrick scale, which essentially categorizes people based off skin tone and the manner in which these skin tones react to UV exposure. The lower numbers on the Fitzpatrick scale tend to be more fair and a lot more susceptible to UV damage, as in like the effects show a lot more readily. Whereas those on the higher end of the scale don't tend to show those results as easily. They don't tend to burn. And therefore it's a matter of how do you test the effects of the UV radiation on these deeper skin tones. When it comes to SPF testing, essentially these volunteers come in. We don't really know who the volunteers are, where they fall in those ranges, but generally results show that the individuals who do take part in these tests tend to be on the lower end of that scale. So think about anyone from a Fitzpatrick one through three going in for these tests, even within those few categories, there's still a good range of how those individuals are going to react to the UV exposure, therefore affecting how the UV results are skewed. And so with the inconsistency of what testing on a living biological subject involves, as well as the volunteer group that the sunscreen was tested on, and that's not considering the factors of is the equipment up to date and is it well maintained, as well as are the people doing the testing adequately trained for it, you get the final advertised SPF on the packaging. But again, the SPF that's actually advertised on the sunscreen is an average of a few different tests. For example, if you have an SPF 30, realistic what the test show could be anywhere from an SPF of 25 to 35 to get you somewhere around a 30, probably above a 30. And then they just round it down just to give you a more safe bet. And realistically, that's like the best case scenario, safe bets, because you have to factor in things like daily lifestyle. Are you wearing enough? What conditions your skin in? What skin type do you have? What are you doing on the day that you're wearing the sunscreen? 
sunscreen? What is the UV index on that specific day? Is it higher or lower than the UV index used for the actual sunscreen test? A lot of variables go into play realistically for how a sunscreen is going to act, how it's going to be tested, and what those values are going to give you. And so with that, in terms of what's actually being advertised on the bottle versus what's actually attainable on a general basis, there's been some concern as to what can be advertised or should be advertised on the bottle. A couple different points being potentially showing you could get up to this protection so long as you wore a specific amount. And that part is really important, putting on an adequate amount of sunscreen. I have a whole video on that as well up here. But also potentially having a range advertised where realistically you could get anywhere between these two numbers because again, when you're testing the sunscreens out in vivo in a lab, you're getting a range of values and that's what they're averaging to give you that SPF. I feel like having that one value sets expectations at a certain level when realistically the likelihood of attaining that value is dependent on user ability and user error as well. And so with that, a lot of times I get questions from people in my comments asking about specific sunscreens, like, can I trust this giving me this much protection? How can I know I'm getting the advertised protection on a sunscreen? Like, am I protected on a daily basis? And one thing I will say, my opinion on this is, wear a sunscreen, wear enough sunscreen. If protection value really matters, obviously find one that hopefully advertises a high value and consistently reapply that. But also know there is limitations as to what sunscreen itself can actually offer you no matter what the SPF value is. Realistically, wearing sunscreen is a small fraction in the overall pie of sun protection factors. You will need to be factoring in what part of you is covered. Are you wearing UPF value clothing? Are you covered from the sun with a hat? Are you avoiding very high direct UV exposure in the middle of the day? There's a lot more that goes into it than just your sunscreen. I feel like, I say this all the time, people put a lot of their eggs in that sunscreen basket when sunscreen can only do so much for you. Also something I want to point out is people always say that this controversy is around chemical sunscreens and when to go to mineral sunscreens. No, this is a sunscreen wide, industry wide situation in terms of testing. They're all tested the same way. Each of them has pros, each of them has limitations, each of them has cons. People going towards mineral sunscreens, honestly for me, there's more con in that just because first and foremost, they have their white cast. People generally don't put on enough of those because they are afraid of the white cast. And secondly, my perspective, looking at what UV filters that I'm able to use, and the science behind them. You get much more broad spectrum protection using chemical filters than you do mineral filters. To me, there's only so much you can really do without sacrificing the elegance of a formula or the user experience that you're getting from a formulation. And so there's pros and cons to both. Both mineral and chemical sunscreens are subjected to the same test and therefore are subjected to the same controversy at hand at the moment. So now getting into the brand situation and what's been going on within the industry with specific products. Obviously we know that Pareto and Keep Cool were kind of the catalyst for all this happening. There's been a long time skepticism about those products due to the percentage of the filters used. People saw those in the formulations at such low values and they're like, there is no way. There are people on Reddit putting the percentage of those filters into a specific like SPF measuring program. And just based off the filters, they were getting SPF of about four. When realistically, we've seen a range of tests on those sunscreens getting an SPF of anywhere between 15 to 30, which is a wide range for a sunscreen that should have only gotten an SPF of four based only on those filters, which goes to show that a sunscreen is a lot more than just the filters involved. You have things like antioxidant, SPF boosters, film forming agents, a lot goes into making a sunscreen work and increasing the SPF value. At this point, a lot of brands are pulling their sunscreens from the market just because they don't want to fall under that same controversy and they just want to make sure that what they have out there is good. If anything, a lot of companies are starting to switch manufacturers to more reliable sunscreen focused manufacturers. Another creator, Odile Minaud, has a lot of great content both on YouTube and on her Twitter account, kind of explaining a lot of things that happen just because she works very closely with Korean regulations. She knows a lot about what goes on in that market. I just want to point out a specific video of her that I watched recently that people ask, how was it that this was able to happen? Isn't the KFDA like, don't they have regulations? How are people like skirting around these? As Odile explains in her video, there's three ways to manufacture a product. And this is realistic. I've seen this personally behind the scenes and product development perspective. But those three ways are either you formulate and manufacture everything in house. And there's very few brands that do this. She highlights a couple in her video. The second way is you formulate and develop the product in house, but you handle manufacturing to someone else, a third party, and they take care of like all the manufacturing and that kind of stuff. But you still own the rights to the formulation and you develop that. Then the third option is everything goes to a third party. They develop, they manufacture, they do all that for the formulation for you. 
you are essentially just buying that from them. And that's also known as private labeling, which is a very common thing. We see it a lot here in the West too. But where Pareto and Keep Cool and that all fell under was that they handed their stuff off to a third party company who took a base formulation that had prior to that been approved by the KFDA to have that specific SPF value. But then each of those companies doctored their things and due to a specific loophole in the Korean regulatory system, where so long as you had specific metrics matching that original formulation that was approved, you could deviate and still have that advertised value on your packaging. Well, those companies obviously deviated too much from the original, specifically in wanting to have a more elegant texture, specific skin feel, and that's where they significantly dropped as well. Another point Odile actually pointed out on Twitter in a thread recently was that originally in the original formulation for, I forget which one, there was titanium dioxide in the ingredients list. But titanium dioxide can be labeled in two ways on an ingredients list, either as a colorant, specifically just tinting the formulation, or as a UV filter. And in that first approved ingredients list, it was actually included as a colorant, not an SPF filter. And so when they were doctoring the formulation for the other company, they pulled that ingredient out, not thinking it would affect the SPF. SPF and obviously pulling out a substantial amount of titanium did alter the SPF substantially. If you want more tea on this, check out Odile's video. It was actually very informative, very well done. I learned a lot from watching that video. I'll have the link down below in the description box. A point worth noting is that that going to a third party and buying a formulation and changing it up is very frequently done. We see it here in the West. I think more recently I saw it in that super goob Kylie sunscreen Kroger sunscreen situation where you had very similar ingredients lists, very similar experiences and feels and everything from the product from two different brands and it just looked like they got them from the same manufacturer. The difference is here in the US, we don't have to disclose who the manufacturer is. In Korea, you do. One of the reasons companies tend to go through these third party systems to just buy a formulation, reformulate it a little bit and sell it as their own, is the fact that sunscreen manufacturing development costs an obscene amount of money. Just to send a product out to get SPF testing and that kind of stuff done costs upwards of $40,000, $50,000. And so if you don't have that kind of capital and that kind of investment on you to go forth and develop up a whole sunscreen you're going to go to someone that you trust that's giving you a product that they say hey we got this product tested it's this value you can change a couple things and you'll be good that makes sense from a small business perspective the brands that really have the capability of formulating and doing all this stuff in-house themselves are umbrella companies they got mad money and so that's why we see a lot of these smaller brands going to these third-party systems so there's a lot of money that goes into this there's a lot of financial stuff involved and so that's where you have to start to see as a company realistically what they're able to output and why they they choose to go through third party systems. And then recently Crave Beauty got thrown into the mix. That was a little bit more shocking to me. They decided to go retest like every other Korean company was, either they pulled their product or they retested. And while initially confident in having disclosed prior to the whole thing that their SPF had tested at above a 50, I believe at a 55, with new third party testing done here in the US, the SPF value is actually lower than 50 and they pull their product from the market. And you have a lot of other brands right now who are in the process of reformulating their products as well. So stay tuned, I guess. We're gonna have like a renaissance of Korean sunscreens, hopefully that are just as elegant, but have great, if not even better advertised protection than what they had initially. And so with all that said, you might just be thinking, well, like why is the Korean system having this issue right now? But realistically, again, this is not just a Korean only thing. This last week, Versed, a brand that sold in Target, recently pulled their Guards Up sunscreen off the market due to reformulating issues. They disclosed in their statement that it wasn't a matter of the SPF value. They went through third-party testing and did get an SPF that matched the packaging, but it was more an issue of formulation inconsistencies. There were people complaining about texture and graininess in certain batches of the sunscreen compared to others. I've reviewed the Verse Guards Up sunscreen on my channel. It was a sunscreen that I did not enjoy. It was not a fun sunscreen to use, but also I got a really bad reaction from it, which is not a fault of the sunscreen. That's just a me thing. Skin is very subjective, but that sunscreen itself was not fun to use. For me, it just started to clump up and pill up, or I just could not get a uniform layer of it on my skin. I know people had very similar issues with it, and I know people who like the sunscreen who did notice inconsistencies from bottle to bottle. And so one thing to point out that this is a small company that felt the need that, okay, this is an issue that we've been having for a long time now. My review came out almost a year ago. Let's finally pull this product off the shelves, reformulate it, hopefully get a much better product. And they recognized their sunscreen was not performing the way it needed to, not in terms of SPF value, which we're gonna trust that that is correct, but rather in the way that a sunscreen is actually supposed to perform. Again, a sunscreen reliance on a very uniform even film of protection if your sunscreen is balling up clumping up not being able to form an even layer you're not getting adequate protection you're essentially like it's like putting swiss cheese on your face you have a lot of holes everywhere that 
or really defeating the purpose of having that product on your face in the first place. Other brands like Elta MD, which is like a sunscreen superstar that everyone loves and everyone asks me to review all the time, also had an issue with a sunscreen spray of theirs not meeting the advertised protection on the bottle, as well as another major sunscreen brand, Istin, having similar issues in the past as well. And then we've all seen the recent reports from people pointing out that the issue is extended beyond Korea. You have brands like Neutrogena and Copper Tone, who've also had similar issues with sunscreens of theirs not matching the advertised protection values either. So this is industry wide. This is definitely a widespread issue, but I'm putting issue in quotes because it's one of those things where there's so many variances and variables involved in the testing and formulating and development of these products. Hopefully we see an improvement of as a result of this and as technologies advance, but realistically, it's one of these things that it's just for the last few decades has been a thing. And just because of the scrutiny we have on sunscreens now is becoming a lot more prevalent. And with that, thank you guys for watching. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, notification bell, so that you know when I post more skincare, sunscreen, and fancy related content on my channel. Give me a thumbs up and a good down below in the comments. Let me know what are your thoughts on what I just said? What are your opinions on things that have been going on recently with sunscreens. Sound off and thanks for watching guys. Bye.